Good morning. Welcome to our online worship service today at Bethel. Thank you for joining us. Uh, We're excited that you have. Uh, We trust and pray that the Lord has something in store uh, for each of us this morning as we worship Him together. Uh, Last week here at our in-person service at 930, uh, we honored our college graduates. Uh, It was a fun and exciting time just to recognize God's hand in their lives and to pray for them as they begin new adventures. So continue to remember Becca and Taylor uh, in your prayers that God would continue to guide them uh, in these days forward. This week, uh, our in-person service, we are recognizing our high school graduates. Uh, So that will be an exciting time just to to take note of God's activity in their lives as well and to pray for them uh, as they start out to a new chapter. Uh, Sunday, June the 6th, we want to invite you to a special worship service here at Bethel. Uh, We're going to kick Sunday school back off on that morning. So those classes will begin at 930. Uh, If you are not or have not been involved in a Sunday school class, this is a great time to jump in and and become involved in Sunday school in a small group Bible study. Uh, We have classes of all ages and we would love for you to come and to to study God's Word together with us. After Sunday school that morning, we've got a a special worship service at 1030, uh, and it's going to be a worship celebration time. Uh, We're going to have lots of singing and and a prayer time and and different things, but it's going to be a morning of celebration as we thank God for His hand here at Bethel and His guidance, and we continue to look forward to Him in these days ahead. Uh, There's going to be lots of music. We're going to sing together. I'm excited about that morning of worship. So if you're able to, we would love for you to join us June 6th at 1030 for that worship celebration service. Uh, And we just trust that God has great things in store that morning. As we uh, begin our time together here today, let's pray and ask God to bless our worship service today and to speak into our hearts and lives. God, I thank you for the opportunity to worship with brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I pray that you would be glorified uh, through our worship. Lord, that uh, during this time together, we would just focus our minds and still and and quiet our hearts, Lord, and focus them on you. Lord, that we would listen expectantly to hear from you as you speak to us today. God, give us insight as we study your word. And most of all, we pray that Jesus would be exalted and that, God, you would be glorified through our time here together today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Grab your Bible this morning and turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 5 as we continue on in our study in the book of Acts. Today we're going to be seeing the miraculous power of Christ and how it was evident within the church. Uh, It was undeniable that that the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit uh, was upon the believers in the early church. So we think about the early church, as we've seen the last several weeks, there was an uncommon unity that was there. Uh, Luke records and he says that there was one heart and one soul. There was there was one heartbeat and that was toward uh, the desire to have boldness to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, that, that unity also resulted in a, a love for God and a love for others. But the church, they had a singular focus and they were all on the same page. And that was to make Jesus and the gospel known. Well, Satan, he doesn't like it when the church is serious about uh, the marching orders that we've been given and being a witness for Christ. And and Satan tries to throw sin into the lives of believers and into the church to, to make us veer off and to stray from keeping the main thing the main thing. And we saw it with Ananias and Sapphira that uh they they gave in to the temptation to sin and they sold property and withheld some of those proceeds, but they were acting like they were generous and they were giving it all. They were trying to lie and be deceptive to God and to the people uh, to where they appeared better than they were. And, and Satan appeals to that desire within our hearts and lives to uh, to puff ourselves up instead of focusing on Jesus Christ. We talked about and looked at how the church, it's important to realize that that sin needs to be addressed. It needs to be dealt with. It was in Ananias and Sapphira's life. And and that's the the truth of the gospel is that God is holy and perfect and we are sinful people. And and that, that creates a chasm between us. It breaks that relationship that we were created to have. And, and that sin is a barrier. And because God is holy and perfect, Uh, He requires a payment for sin. That's why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to to make that payment on behalf of those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ to make that relationship right again. But for those who have never trusted in Jesus Christ, that that don't have a relationship with him and and have never uh, surrendered their life to follow Christ, there will still be a payment for sin. And namely, it's, it's going to be a, a personal payment that one day we'll have to make for those who don't know Jesus Christ. And Ananias and Sapphira are a picture of that payment for sin. The, the payment was their own lives. That was the, the consequence and punishment of their sin. But that's the beauty of the gospel is that because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to make that payment. We trust in the payment that we that he made because we realize that we can't fix it ourselves. Last week, we we talked about in confronting and addressing sin within the church that that we need to take sin more seriously. There needs to be accountability and and we need to be uh, bold and courageous enough to confront sin in our own lives, not to try to mask it or gloss over it or uh, you know, try to deceive ourselves that our sin isn't that big of a deal, but to really just be honest and see our sin as God sees our sin. So we have to confront sin in our own lives. But Jesus taught in Matthew 18 that for followers of Christ, for his disciples, we need to, to address sin in the lives of our brothers and sisters as well. We need to do that lovingly. All right. It, it's not beating over the head or in judgment, but we lovingly should desire to have conversations and accountability about sin with the goal of restoration. We talked about last week how how after this accountability can take place or, or the seriousness of sin, uh, unity continued to grow within the early church. And it, it's going to lead into our text today. There was a great fear. Uh, kind of around the church as, as people from the outside were looking in and considering uh, the, the great cost, the commitment to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bible, uh, let's jump into Acts chapter five, beginning in verse 12. 
We hit, I hit on uh, one or two of these verses just a little bit last week, but now we're going to look at it a little bit more in context as it's written. So Acts 5, beginning with verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Let's pray and ask God to uh, give us insight and to speak to us today through his word. Lord, I thank you for your word and the instruction that it gives. Lord, the, the light that it shines onto our path as we are followers of Christ, the direction and navigation that it guides us with in our daily lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see and understand your word this morning, that your Holy Spirit would just uh, illumine our hearts and our minds, help us to receive your word. But even more than that, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower us to be doers of your word and not just hearers only. Uh, we ask that you would speak today and make us more like Jesus Christ from our time together in your word. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. So remember, we're, we're talking today about the miraculous power of Christ that was evident in the lives of believers and in the early church. So as there's been accountability for sin, it leads to unity again. And we see that in verse 12 here in chapter five it says now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. Solomon's portico was it was an area. All right. There around the temple. Uh, where uh, the believers, the early church, they would meet there. And it, it says, Luke records, and he says that there were many signs and wonders. There were miraculous things that were happening and going on as the early church continued to meet together. But notice there was that unity. It says that they were all together. All right. So that's more than just in presence. Uh, it goes back to that one heart and one soul that Luke tells us was within the early church the focus and drive and passion and hunger for sharing about Jesus Christ and the gospel. So they were unified together. And there were miracles that would take place as they gathered with one another. All right, these signs and wonders, they were, they were regular. They were common occurrence. Okay, they were not common things that were happening, but they happened regularly. All right, uh, it would be easy to look to this early church or to look to the apostles and say, wow, they've got amazing power or look at the apostles, how God was using them. All right. And it would be easy to kind of lift up the apostles in the early church and, and to, to wonder, man, this miraculous power, who's that for? Who is it? And, and it would be easy to cast our focus on the apostles, but we would completely miss the boat if that's what we did this morning. Because what if what have the apostles already in the text of Acts? What have they told us? All right. Let's think back to another time that a miracle happened and the response that Peter and John had in chapter three. Peter and John were on their way to the temple and there was the man lame that uh, Peter told to get up and to walk. All right. And and everybody recognized that man around the temple and they were like, whoa, that's the guy. He's the guy that sits by that gate. He's the guy that. He doesn't walk. What's he doing walking? And the crowd, they gathered around and they were wondering and asking Peter and John, you know, about this miraculous power. Well, in chapter three, beginning in verse 12, Peter explained it to the crowd and to the people. It says, when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk? Peter saying, why are you looking at us? This isn't a, we can't do this. This isn't a power that we have. All right. And then he explains it beginning in verse 13. He says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you have delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. 
But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are witnesses. Now, speaking of Christ, it says, and his name by faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So Peter and John, they say, that's not us. It's Jesus and the power of Jesus name. All right. But there's there's another example. Peter and John, they give account to the crowd that's gathered there in the temple when the lame man is healed. But then the religious council, they want to know what's going on, too. So they call Peter and John in and they question Peter and John. All right. And this is in chapter four, beginning in verse seven. When they had set them in the midst, they inquired the council. They inquired by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there's salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. All right. So miracles were taking place and, and people were wondering, they were inquisitive. How's this happening? Why is it happening? You know, man, the apostles, is there something special about you guys? How are you able to do this? And the apostles, they recognize that this miraculous power of Jesus Christ, that, that God gives to this, this early church, this gathering of believers, this power that is present, they recognize that it's there for a very special and specific purpose. All right. Notice both times Peter and John give account in chapter three and in chapter four. They don't just say, well, hey, it's, it's not power of us. It's the power of Jesus. But what else? They went into greater detail. They said this Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, who God exalted, God has placed him in the, the place of exaltation. All right. And, and then to the, the Sanhedrin, they say, hey, this man that you crucified, that you're guilty of God raised from the dead. And actually, you've rejected him as a stone, but he's the cornerstone. And there's no other name on earth by which man can be saved. There's no other name that can bring reconciliation between God and man, that can provide a, a way of right relationship between man and God. So the apostles saw each of these miracles as an opportunity to point to the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. And that's that's important and key for us to remember right here. The apostles, you know, they could have they could have almost assumed rock star status. Later on in this text, it says that, that they brought people and set them in the streets on mats and cots so that Peter's shadow would fall on them as he walked by. But, you know, that that wasn't the goal of the apostles. The apostles were not we're not seeing these these miracles and this power as as a way to build themselves up or to make a name for themselves. They recognized that this was an opportunity to be bold and, and these miracles provided a platform for them to be bold, to speak to the life, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and that he is the only way of salvation. So their purpose in these miracles was to make Jesus Christ known. You know, it. It might be interesting that, that if, if we were around and we heard of these miraculous happenings, you know, uh, there might be a buzz and we might want to go and see for ourselves. But listen to how the, the general public responded back in Acts chapter five, the end of verse 12, it says, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. But listen to verse 13. None of the rest, those who were outside of the church, the, the general public, none of the rest dared join them. But the people held them in high esteem. So the power of God and the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit was visible and evident. This miraculous power in the life of the early church. But unbelievers, they didn't come flocking. 
They didn't, they didn't want to associate themselves with the church because they were scared. All right, they had seen and observed the early church. They heard the story of Ananias and Sapphira. All right, and, and they knew that, that with the consequences of sin, that being a follower of Christ was not just a hop on the bandwagon kind of thing. That there was a great cost. There was a great commitment. There was great responsibility, but there was great accountability, even with sin and the manner of living, all right, to where the, the general public, there was, there was a little bit of fear and trepidation as they saw the church, all right? But they weren't judgmental against it. They didn't say, well, that, that bunch of crazy people. No, it says that there was, there was a fear, but they held the church in high regard and high esteem. They recognized the great level of commitment with accountability to sin, that there was unselfish generosity, that there was one heartbeat for making Jesus known and exalting him. And they didn't want to jump into it lightly. So they observed and they respected. But they didn't want to jump on the bandwagon. And what this created was was a genuineness within the church. It created an authenticity to where there weren't people that, that were putting on a front. There weren't people that were playing church and acting church. There weren't people that were saying the right thing, but then doing something completely different. Okay, they weren't perfect Christians, but they knew that they, they took sin seriously. And there was great accountability and unity within the church. All right, and it, it created this purity within the church of genuine believers to where the church was what the church was supposed to be. All right. Listen, when the church is unified with the singular focus of making Jesus Christ known and loving God and loving others. Look and see what happens in verse 14. It says, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. So when there was this, this, this genuine, authentic nature to where the cost of being a Christ follower was considered, but it was upheld and lived out, God did miraculous things. It says multitudes of men and women were added to the church. And that's a work that God did because the church, they were fulfilling Christ's Instruction, Christ's marching orders that he gave them in Acts 1.8, where he said, you're going to have uh, power. You will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the way to the end of the world. Be my witnesses. I'll give you the power to do it. Just be faithful in, in making the truth of the gospel and God's glory and goodness known. All right, those were the instructions. The church took it seriously. And what happened? God added to their number. Countless men and women, the church grew like never before. We see that, that it changed even their manner and their way of life and the way that they went about things. Verses 15 and 16, it says, so that they even carried, they carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem. It's that, that spread of the gospel is starting to take place. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. And they were all healed. The miraculous power and, and life changing truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ was evident. It was undeniable. It was seen. And, and the people could see it in healing that was taking place. All right. There were people with physical ailments. Think about the lame man. Well, there were others who were sick and not able to walk. All right. That were brought to the apostles. And they were being healed. All right. But it wasn't just physical healing because it says that that even those who were afflicted with unclean spirits were brought and they were healed. So there was physical healing that was taking place and there was spiritual healing that was taking place too. And it was all the power of Jesus Christ. This spiritual healing, people were being released from the chains of, 
of, I'm sure, addiction, depression, anger, bitterness, even being possessed by spirits. All right. God's spirit was moving in a great and a mighty way that could not be credited to anything else in this early church. Jesus was changing lives. From far and wide towns outside of Jerusalem, people were coming to be healed. But again, remember, it's not just physical healing. It was the faith that they had placed in Jesus Christ in spiritual healing and spiritual transformation and and life change from darkness to light, from being far from God to having a relationship with God, from being uh, resistant to Jesus Christ, to accepting Jesus Christ from being your own boss and doing your own thing and living in sin to surrendering your life to God and to Jesus Christ to where he is your boss and living a life that follows him to make him known. Life change was taking place and what happened within the church. The people who were believers, what did they do? They reached out to the people who were around them in need, to friends, to neighbors, to others that had need. They told others. They pointed toward Christ. It says they even carried others. Why do you think people were motivated to bring others, come and see, experience? Why do you think they were motivated to do that? It was to make Jesus known, but it was because they had experienced it in their own life. They saw the life transformation, the miraculous power that was that was there and had changed their life through Jesus Christ. And they wanted others to experience it, too. So this early church, they had a passion and a hunger for the gospel, for Jesus to be made known. And they lived in unity with one another. All right. There was great authenticity, a genuineness. There was accountability in dealing with sin. But most of all, there was boldness to proclaim Jesus Christ. And as they did, miraculous things happened and multitudes of lives were changed. God moved. People were healed. And the church grew. We may ask the question, what about miracles today? What about, uh, uh, you know, and we may want to want to wonder about things like that. But listen, if that's what we get from this text, we miss the boat. God has the power to do whatever he wants to do. If God wants to work miracles, you know, and we hear of people being healed. We hear of miracles happening on the mission field to where people come to faith in Jesus Christ because of it. Okay, God's not always going to work in miracles. All right. He can. He's not always going to do that. We have the full revelation of scripture and and we have where God reveals himself and where Christ is revealed and the Holy Spirit is there to, to help us understand and see the truth of the gospel. But are we serious about being witnesses? Have we experienced that life change and life transformation Because if we have, it should produce within us a unity to where the main thing is the main thing. All right. We're not distracted by peripheral issues, things that might not really matter. But there's a centrality of the gospel and there's a passion to make Jesus known to where that creates a unity in living in relationship with one another to where we we take God's word seriously and we deal with sin in our lives and in the lives of others. And, And it creates this atmosphere as we follow God and have our eyes so fixed on Jesus Christ that God miraculously calls multitudes to salvation. I pray for days that there are multitudes of men and women that come to faith in Jesus Christ. I pray that God uses Bethel to do that. I pray that God uses me as a pastor to do that. I pray that God uses you as a follower of Christ to do that. But remember, 
It's not about the apostles. It's not about Bethel. It's not about me. It's not about you. Because we recognize that we and ourselves are still in desperate need of the gospel. And it gives opportunity to point toward Jesus Christ and say, Jesus Christ alone is where this power comes from. No other name on heaven or earth by which man can be saved, by which healing and restoration can take place. So I pray that God would give us a passion like never before for the gospel, to love him and follow him. And that that would be the singular focus and heartbeat of our lives to make Jesus known and that we would experience the power of the Holy Spirit and that we would see lives changed and transformed. I know of countless people who are far from Christ that need healing. You do as well. They may be family members or neighbors or coworkers. We know the healer and we know the freedom that's found in Jesus Christ. That he's the only way to have a right relationship with God. The beauty of the gospel is on display when we share that truth with others who are in need. I pray that we would be faithful to do that. God, what an awesome picture of the signs and wonders that were taking place in this early church. Lives were transformed and changed. People came to faith and relationship with you. And God, it was because there was a, a hunger and a thirst in a singular heartbeat to make Jesus Christ known and to proclaim the gospel. So God, I pray that you would develop that within us. God, that you would help us to realize it's not about us. It's not about our church. It's not about our church growing in numbers, but it's about Jesus being made known. And it's about people coming to faith and, and the power of Christ being evident in their lives as well. God, we all know people that need healing. God, people who are far from you. And I pray that we would be faithful to be witnesses. Lord, to go, to seek them out, to reach out, to bring them. Lord, to extend the truth of the gospel, to share, to proclaim. Lord, to love. God, help that to be our singular heartbeat. And we trust that your power and the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be evident and that multitudes of men and women will come to faith in Christ. Lord, your word says it. And we pray for it this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.